questions orales, l'honorable chef de l'opposition. The Honorable Leader of the Opposition. After, after eight years, this Prime Minister is not worth the cost or the lack of competition. Yesterday, the Competition Bureau reported that now the lack of competition is worse than at any time in 20 years, leading to higher prices for consumers and higher profits for corporate oligarchs. Now the, the Liberal government is considering allowing Canada's biggest bank, gobble up the seventh biggest bank, to eliminate competition and force up mortgage rates on Canadians who already can't afford to pay their bills. Will the government side with consumers and home buyers instead of corporate oligarchs and big banks and block this merger. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, as the Conservative leader recycles common sense cliches from decades ago, like an automaton from the Mike Harris era, our government has taken decisive action to help Canadians with the price of groceries by supporting more competition in the marketplace and by increasing housing supply by waiving GST on new rental construction. These are two significant measures the members opposite can support right now by supporting the government's bill on affordability. But they've stated that that they won't support that. Can someone from the opposition benches please explain to all of us how voting against measures that are going to substantially help middle-class families, how is that common sense? I'll tell you it's not common sense. Spending eight million dollars on a barn, Mr. Speaker. We just found out that the Prime Minister's Capital Commission spent $8 million to replace a barn at Rideau Hall. We've long said that this Prime Minister is not worth the cost after eight long years. While Canadians cannot afford a home, how is it that this Prime Minister is spending $8 million on a barn? And by the way, was it made of gold? <laughs> Uh, quite the words from the Leader of the Opposition. I remind him when he was responsible for housing during the Harper years, $300 million spent for housing, less than 100 homes built. Do the math, Mr. Speaker. $3 million a home. That's the, that's the record of so-called fiscal responsibility on the other side. On this side, we are getting homes built. Just this morning, the Prime Minister announced over $100 million for the city of Brampton that's going to lead to, in the coming years, 24,000 homes being built. Oh, wow. We're going to continue to work with municipalities, Mr. Speaker, through partnership. There, there. Good job. I would encourage all members, including uh, the members who ask questions, to please listen to the responses uh, and then when they have the opportunity to take the floor again uh, to pose their questions. The Honourable Member for megantic After eight years with this Prime Minister, he's not worth the cost. So much money has been wasted. McKinsey consultations, arrive can, $6,000 a night for a hotel room. Today we found out that the government wasted $8 million for what? For a barn. How can you spend $8 million on a barn on whose land? The Governor General's. Food banks are lacking resources. Is this the Liberals' priorities? Spend eight million dollars on a barn on the Governor General's property? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Merci beaucoup, uh, Monsieur le Président. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Obviously, we've been there for Canadians. We've invested to support them several times. And the Conservatives voted against those measures. But when the Conservatives were in power, seven consecutive budgets led to deficits. We have the lowest deficit of all G7 countries right now. And we will continue to be financially responsible. The Honourable Member for mekong responsible. Financially responsible. After eight years of liberal expenditures leading to inflation, inflation in Quebec is the highest in the country. People have to permanently live with their parents because everything costs too much. Interest rates are so high that liberals have stolen the dream of young people to become homeowners for two years. Mortgages went up by 40 percent. After eight years with the liberals, the cost of rent has doubled. When will the liberals stop mortgaging the future of young people 
and allow them to achieve their own dream of becoming a homeowner. Then I had the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, we have a bill before us right now which will accelerate the construction of housing throughout Canada. In my riding in Montreal, co-ops are being built for families, our seniors and our youth. The Conservatives don't want to invest to build more housing, to reduce costs for all Canadians. It doesn't make any sense. If they really have the interests of Canadians at heart, why are they voting against their interests? The Honourable Member for Mekon Mr. Speaker, if they really wanted to pass Bill C-56, it's been since October 5th that the Liberals haven't called the bill in the House. We need a reason. We, we need to understand what they want. In the meantime, the middle class know what's going on. They're lining up at food banks. In the newspapers this morning, food banks are struggling. The cost of food has gone up by 23 percent. Mr. Speaker, the Liberals and the Bloc want to radically increase the carbon tax. It's expensive to vote for the Bloc and the Liberals. Will the Liberals finally decide to cut their costly tax? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. I, I recognize that the rising cost does hurt Canadians. And that's why we look across the way and we would like to see the Conservative Party stop playing the games. The destructive force that they are constantly playing inside the House, the holding up of legislation, whether it's dealing with uh, providing rebates of one form or another, whether it's building the Atlantic Accord for Atlantic Canada, whether it's talking about green jobs into the future, we're trying to address the needs of Canadians and the Conservative Party continues to play games inside the chamber. Shame on them. Then I have deputy de Saint Jean. The Honourable Member for Saint Jean. Mr. Speaker, it looks like humanitarian aid will be able to get into Gaza today, but we already know that it will be insufficient. Only 20 trucks will be able to get through when really a minimum of 100 is needed every day, according to the UN. As we speak, tons of humanita humanitarian aid are blocked on the tarmac of an Egyptian airport because they can't get through. Will the Prime Minister insist, or did the Prime Minister insist over the last 24 hours for this to be resolved? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Decisions made by Israel and Egypt to allow humanitarian aid into Gaza through Rafat is an important step to guarantee assistance to civilians in Gaza. However, there's a lot to be done. Unobstructed and quick access is essential to meet the needs of Palestinian citizens in Gaza. International law must be respected, always. The Honourable Member for Saint-Jean. We all hope for light at the end of the tunnel in this terrible war, but there are dark hours ahead of us. Calls from many countries to flee Lebanon say a lot. Everybody's expecting for the conflict to get worse. As the humanitarian crisis worsens, humanitarian aid is already not enough. Canada cannot maintain the status quo. It has to use its political weight. What will the government do right now to make sure that humanitarian, humanitarian aid gets through? Then I have Secretary the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Relieving human suffering is our absolute priority. We were the first Western country to provide humanitarian aid. We're using every diplomatic channel and are in constant communication with our partners and organizations on the ground. Our immediate goal is to open humanitarian corridors, offer safety and shelter to those fleeing the war, and allow us aid to get through. And I have dictated. The Honourable Member for Vancouver East. The Auditor issued a damning report about processing delays in immigration. The most vulnerable are made to wait the longest due to liberal mismanagement. 
Offices in Sub-Sahara Africa are chronically underfunded and they have the highest volume. Applications are untouched for up to 20 months. The average wait time for refugees is now three years. People who are being persecuted don't have three years to wait. Will the minister take immediate action to process the unacceptable backlogs for refugees? Here, here. The Honorable Prime Minister, Secretary. You know, it's it's a great concern. We all want to see uh, immigration processes speed up. And what you'll see is that over the last number of years, we have seen processing times improved in many different areas. In many different areas, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker. Whether it is dealing with the sponsoring of parents, uh, for example, uh, sponsoring of spouses, the, we have seen dramatic increases. There are areas in which we do need uh, to to improve upon, and I can assure the member that we are, in fact, making uh, progress in all the different areas as much as possible. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. One in four Nanaimo renters are in core housing need, meaning that where they live is either unaffordable, unsuitable, or inadequate. And these are people who have housing. Too many do not. Nanaimo has a housing problem larger than its size, and we're seeing the symptoms of this all around us. People deserve better than years of liberal and conservative half measures. People deserve a place to call home. So why is it that the government is doubling down on their failed housing plan? That's right. <laughs> The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. I thank that member and the NDP caucus for supporting this government to double funding in response to homelessness. We continue to work with municipalities across the country. We continue to work with not-for-profit organizations. And it was this government that recognized, of course, Mr. Speaker, that there is a human right to housing. In that vein, we're seeing results, and there's more to do, but 70,000 people who were on the street are no longer on the street. 122,000 people who were close to homeless are not in that position anymore because of the national housing strategy. Thank you very much. Here, here. The NAB Deputy de Paris Sound, Muskoka. After eight years of this NDP Liberal government, all Canadians now know that the Prime Minister is just simply not worth the cost. In 2021, a couple from Fergus, Ontario, swapped their four-bedroom, 2,400-square-foot home on three-quarters of an acre for a 6,300-square-foot, 16th-century French chateau on 37 acres near the Bordeaux wine region in the south of France. Today, they admit that if they were to sell that mansion in the south of France, they wouldn't have enough money to buy their old home in Fergus. So I'm wondering why it is cheaper to buy a mansion in the south of France than a family home in rural Ontario. The Honourable Member, or rather the Honourable Prime Minister Secretary. He is a former mayor and he knows, therefore, that the affordability challenge that Canadians face, whether it's respect to rent or whether it's respect to the challenge of buying a home is due to a lack of supply. This government recognizes that. That's why we've moved ahead to put incentives on the table for the private sector, for example, for builders. Lifting the GST on the construction of purpose-built rentals, period. That side wants to maintain the tax for the purposes of building rental homes for the middle class. It's unacceptable. It's a reckless approach, Mr. Speaker. Then I have Deputy de Paris San Muskoka. Well, I, I think the government maybe misses the point. Canada has 20 times the land and half the people of France, and it's still cheaper to buy a house in France. But, of course, after eight years of this Prime Minister's inflationary deficits, mortgage costs have doubled. In 2015, the average mortgage payment was $1,400, Mr. Speaker. Today, it's over $3,500. And now half of Canada's housing markets are severely unaffordable. When will the NDP Liberal Coalition finally end their inflationary deficits so Canadians can afford to keep their homes, Mr. Good Speaker? Question. Mr. Speaker, as I've said, uh, and I emphasize, that the challenge on affordability with respect to housing, writ large, has to do with the lack of supply. When demand is high and supply is limited, you're always going to have an expensive situation. We see that with respect to housing. What this government is doing is working with municipalities to see more homes built. This morning, as I said, 
we saw the city of Brampton move ahead working with this government in, in exchange rather for a $114 million investment. They're going to get more homes built, Mr. Speaker. They're dealing with missing middle housing. They're dealing with exclusionary zoning. I thank the city of Brampton. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, a recent survey has found nearly 70% of millennials and those younger have put off the purchase of a home because of rising prices and rising interest rates. After eight years of this NDP Liberal government, that is their legacy. Uh, inflationary deficits that are driving up the cost of living and making housing out of reach for many young people across the country. It's clear this Prime Minister is not worth the cost, so why doesn't he finally listen to our common sense approach to stop his inflationary spending so that Canadians can afford a home again. Yeah. Oh. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. He talks about young people, and I'll give him credit in his time during uh, being a member of Parliament, he has put issues on the table with respect to youth, so he can support this government, or at least he should have, with respect to the tax-free savings account that this government put in place to help young people save for down payment. Up to $40,000 can be put into that account, again, tax-free. Add to that, of course, the fact that we continue to build more. We continue to put in place, rather, policies that will see more homes built. We're doing that in partnership with municipalities. They're against all of that, Mr. Speaker. They've put half measures on the table. That's not good enough. Shame. Then I have Deputy de Kenora. Mr. Speaker, Canadians don't have the funds to put into a savings account because of the cost of living crisis this government has created. He mentions building homes. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, we have not enough home building in this country uh, to keep up with demand. After eight years of this government, uh, housing prices have skyrocketed. They've actually doubled. Mortgage rates are up, and the young students and young professionals have given up completely on their dream of home ownership. So I ask again, when will they finally stop their inflationary spending so that young people can afford a home. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, when the Conservatives were in power, they ran seven consecutive deficits. I find it interesting that they claim to be uh, so concerned about a 0.7% uh, deficit that we have here in Canada, the lowest of all G7 countries, Mr. Speaker. We are having a we have a serious plan in order to build more homes in this country. We have a serious piece of legislation before this House that the Conservatives are delaying. This will solve the housing crisis, and the Conservatives are delaying that measure, Mr. Speaker. Terrible. Then I have Deputy. I'm going to ask all colleagues, please, to continue, if you have conversations, to continue them outside of the House. It is now ceding the floor to the member from uh, Kelowna Lake Country. Mr. Speaker, Bloomberg just reported on a recent survey that shows how much Canadians are struggling after eight years of this NDP Liberal government's inflationary spending. 65% of Canadians now say they're concerned about saving for retirement, and 63% are concerned about how to prepare for an unexpected financial event. Less savings, more concern, more risk. This Prime Minister is just not worth the cost. When will the Prime Minister end his inflationary spending so Canadians can plan for their future again? Yeah. Yeah. I find it curious that the member opposite even refers to pensions, Mr. Speaker. Under, under what the Conservatives are proposing, they would gut Canada Pension Plan, Mr. Speaker. What the Conservatives are proposing would also result in Canadian families receiving less money from the federal government. You see, we have the Canada Child Benefit. In fact, checks are going out today, Mr. Speaker, to families right across the country. That is important support for families that are having a hard time to make ends meet, and the Conservatives would see that program completely cut. Exactly. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And speak about misinformation and how that response has nothing to do with what's actually happening in people's lives. The latest MNP Consumer Debt Index shows 51% of Canadians are $200 or less away from not being able to complete their financial obligations. Quote, facing a combination of rising debt carrying costs, living expenses, and concern over the potential for continued interest rate and price hikes, many Canadians are stretched uncomfortably close to broke. This is Canada after eight years of this NDP Liberal government. When will the Prime Minister stop his inflationary spending so Canadians can afford to live again? 
l'honorable secrétaire parlementaire. Mr. Speaker, the, the member opposite uh, claims that there is misinformation. I would welcome her to clarify where exactly. You see, the Conservatives have consistently said that they do not want to support Canadians with the programs that we have in place. We have the Canada Child Benefit Program, Mr. Speaker, that is supporting families, that is helping making ends meet. Perhaps she would like to clarify, is that where they are going to cut? Are they going to cut our programs for seniors, Mr. Speaker? Seniors are relying on our government at this time. Mr. Speaker, the, what the Conservatives are proposing is simply reckless. At a time like this, we need responsible government. Too much risk. Too much risk. The Honourable Member for Drummond. Mr. Speaker, let's talk about Amira El Gawabi, the Prime Minister's advisor against Islamophobia. Many noted her long silence on the war between Israel and Hamas. Then everyone noticed when she broke her silence after 10 days, not a word on the attacks perpetuated by Hamas, not a word on the massacres, kidnappings, rapes. We hoped for some sort of condemnation, but there was not even a mention of it. Her role is to build bridges between communities. Does the government consider that she has been building bridges this week? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. President, nous sommes clair, notre gouvernement est... Our government has been clear. The attacks by Hamas against Israel were terrorist attacks. Ms. El Gawabi has a mandate to fight Islamophobia. That is a 100% national mandate. We are working with our new special envoy against anti-Semitism to fight discrimination towards Muslims here and is supporting other communities as well. The Honourable Member for Drummond. Hier, des députés musulmans et juifs du gouvernement se sont réunis malgré leur désaccord pour réitérer conjointement l'importance que tous les citoyens se sentent en sécurité au Canada, peu importe leur religion. Ça, c'est faire œuvre utile, Monsieur le Président, et je salue. Je, euh, je, me... je regrette d'interrompre. Oh, I regret to interrupt the Honourable Member, but apparently we had uh, a translation problem. Is everything resolved now? We will ask the member for Drummond to restart from the top, please. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yesterday, Muslim and Jewish MPs met in spite of their disagreements to reiterate how important it is for all citizens to feel safe in Canada, regardless of their religion. And that's useful. Ms. El Gawabi is unable to recognize even the existence of the attacks by Hamas and the anger, fear, and suffering that they caused, including among her own citizens. Will the go Does the government think that she is missed a an opportunity to be useful? Minister. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, like my honourable colleague, I share the feeling that it is important to protect all Canadians. Everybody is feeling worried about their safety, the safety of their communities, the places where they get together for fully justifiable reasons. I had discussions with ministers from various provinces and territories, and we discussed ways we can reassure and protect Canadians. We're making use of our intelligence services as well, and we're going to mobilize everything. The Honourable Member for Edmonton, Wetaskiwin. Sorry for mispronouncing the title. ...who grew up in the 70s and 80s remember a disastrous Trudeau economic legacy that most definitely was not worth the cost. 14 deficits in 15 years leading to an inflation crisis, an energy crisis, and a housing crisis. The long-term impact of interest payments on that Trudeau debt forced another Liberal government a decade later to cut a devastating 32 per cent from transfers for health care, education and social services. This Liberal NDP government is going down the exact same road. How much will they spend on interest on their record debt this year? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. We constantly talk about the record of fiscal responsibility, Mr. Speaker. During the Stephen Harper years, they ran seven consecutive wow. deficits. Wow. Deficits, Mr. Speaker. 
Under this government, we've seen economic growth. We've seen this government go through an extremely challenging time in the pandemic. But guess what? Businesses are still there. They are finding ways to thrive as a result of the ways that we supported them and continue to find ways to support them. When Canadians need support for key other challenges now, like housing, we are there. They're putting half measures on the table. They're not worth the risk, Mr. Speaker. Here, here. Well, I have dictated Edmonton with Taskawin. Well, Mr. Speaker, after eight years of mind-blowing, unprecedented, previously unfathomable increases in spending, this government's response to every question is to ask why we won't help them spend even more. Again and again and again, we on this side will stand up against an incompetent Liberal government yeah. that is leading us down a path of economic devastation. Again, my question was reasonable and straightforward, and I'd appreciate an answer this time. What will this Liberal NDP government spend on interest on its record debt this year? Yeah. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. They turn it into surplus, they turn it into deficit after deficit after deficit, Mr. Speaker. On this side, we put constructive measures on the table, like lifting GST on the building of rentals for Canadians. They talk about an attachment that they have to a vision for the country that puts the middle class front and centre. It's not true, Mr. Speaker. Why are they proposing at this time, at a time where Canadians are facing a housing crisis, to tax the building of rentals for the middle class? It makes no sense. A reckless approach from start to finish. Then I have deputed Selkirk Interlake Eastman. After eight miserable years, our military heroes can no longer afford this Prime Minister. This NDP Liberal government keeps driving troop morale down and their costs up. A recently leaked report stated, increasingly members will release from the Canadian forces rather than relocate to an area they cannot afford or take in a loss on an existing home. The Canadian Armed Forces are in a crisis and are short 16,000 people, but these Liberals are pushing people away and making things worse. Why is the Prime Minister destroying our military? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, before I start, I just want to recognize that today we remember Adjusa Patrice Vincent, who lost his life in 2014 of the Honourable Member, I would like to say that, um, you know, when you think about the housing uh, situation, just last year in our fiscal um, update, we put $55 million towards uh, the support in residential housing for our CAF member. Also, I would like to uh, acknowledge the support that we're putting on our member when they relocate of the reimbursement legal and real estate fee. Mr. Speaker, we will always be there for our military. Don't have dictated uh, Selkirk Interlake Eastman. Well, Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister is actually repeating liberal history known as the decade of darkness. Soldiers and their families back then were forced to use food banks. There were slashes to training programs. They operated on old equipment and were sent to Afghanistan without proper boots or uniforms. And now this month the headlines read, soldiers asking for donations to help with housing and food costs. Canadian Forces personnel leaving the ranks over lack of affordable housing. Canada looking to cut $1 billion from the national defence budget. Our troops are out there fighting for our freedoms. Why is this Prime Minister attacking their economic freedom? Before I continue, I'd like to encourage members, especially those who are at the far end of the House, to please not have conversations as it can cause a disruption in the House. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And again, I want to say thanks to the member for his question because it actually allows me just to validate some of the measures and the supports that we have put in place for our military. As I mentioned earlier, the reimbursing, the legal and the real estate fees, the covering of some expense for dual residency for up to six months if a CAM member cannot sell their residence. We will continue also supporting our Canadian Armed Forces posted across the country and their family. For example, the post-living differential allowance is intended to help reduce financial burdens for CAF personnel and their family. Mr. Speaker, we will not take any lessons from this side of the House. The Honourable Member from Edmonton Strathcona. 
Mr. Speaker, Canada has supported international justice efforts in response to the wars in Ukraine and Syria, but has refused to support international court investigations in Israel and Palestine. The parties in this conflict and the victims of this conflict need to know the violations of international law will be prosecuted. This includes terror attacks and collective punishment. International law applies to everyone. There are no exceptions. Why won't Canada support independent court investigations into violations of international law by all parties to the war in Israel and Palestine? Non-Arab Secretary Parlementaire. Right now, the alleviating of human suffering is our number one priority. We continue, and we will continue, to push that all parties respect humanitarian and international law. This means access for civilians. This means accountability for those who do not follow international law. And this means that we are using every diplomatic channel that we have to alleviate the suffering and to ensure that aid gets to the Palestinian civilians and that international law is complied with. Thank you. London Fanshawe. The war between Hamas and Israel keeps taking the lives of so many innocent Israelis and Palestinians. The humanitarian crisis in Gaza is getting worse by the minute. People in Gaza have very little access to water, food or electricity. They're forced to flee their homes or be bombed. And half of them are children. Palestinians and Israelis deserve to live in peace, and that's why the NDP has been calling for an immediate ceasefire and the release of the hostages. Why won't this government do everything in their power to save lives by calling for a ceasefire? Mr. Speaker, Canada will continue to support Palestinian civilians in Gaza facing urgent humanitarian needs. Our initial commitment of $10 million in humanitarian assistance to trusted partners in Gaza will provide food, water, emergency medical assistance, and protection services. We were the first Western country to do so, and others have now started following suit. We will continue to be there. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. L'honorable député de, Clo excuse -moi, de Cloverdale, Langley City. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, national parks protect Canada's iconic terrestrial and aquatic environments while providing opportunities for public understanding, education, and enjoyment for these protected areas. Having worked for Parks Canada for more than 30 years prior to politics, I can appreciate the importance of protecting and preserving the beautiful landscapes that represent the very best of Canada. Can the Parliamentary Secretary share with this House the progress that our government is making to protect and conserve these national wonders for future generations? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the Honourable Member for his advocacy and uh, uh, for Parks Canada all these years. Absolutely. Yesterday, our government introduced Bill S-14, Protecting Canada's Natural Wonders Act. This bill ensures that, along with its partners, Parks Canada has the authorities and tools to protect these lands for current and future generations. This represents an increase of more than 12 million hectares protected under legislation, a landmass slightly smaller than the combined area of New Brunswick and Nova Scotia. I hope that all parliamentarians can work together to ensure the passage of this important piece of legislation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yellowhead. Mr. Speaker, after eight long years under the Prime Minister, Canadians expect more than just empty promises on housing. Construction, cost, construction is down and costs are, are climbing up and way up. And this NDP Liberal Co Coalition's inflationary spending feels like a cruel joke to those trying to afford affordable home. This Prime Minister is just not worth the cost. Mr. Speaker, isn't it time for some common sense conservative solutions to ensure every Canadian has a roof over their head? <laughs> Mr. Speaker, as you well know, there is a bill on this table, on this floor rather, that the Conservatives can get behind. The result, if they decided to support it, would be a more affordable situation for builders because it lifts GST off the construction of rental apartments. 
they're not in favor of that, Mr. Oh. Speaker. They want to tax the construction of, of rental apartments for the Shame. middle class. Shame. On top of that, we are putting forward measures to help support builders by making sure there's training programs available so laborers can be available. They've got no support for that, Mr. Speaker. Entirely reckless uh, approach that they take. Then I have Deputy Doxford. Mr. Speaker, after eight long years of this Liberal NDP government, seven million Canadians are now struggling to put food on their tables thanks to their carbon tax. When you tax the farmer who grows the food and you tax the trucker who ships the food, you ultimately punish the Canadian who buys the food. And now we have Canadians driving across the U.S. border to buy basic grocery essentials. This Prime Minister is not worth the cost. Here, here. Will this Prime Minister do the honourable thing, ax the carbon tax and bring home affordable groceries for all Canadians? Here, here, here. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Conservatives consistently use the carbon price as a scapegoat for global inflation in this House. Uh, I think they're having trouble grasping the concept of magnitude. Mr. Speaker, the Bank of Canada Governor recently said carbon pricing contributed 0.15% to inflation. That's equivalent to 15 cents on a $100 grocery bill. While the European Central Bank said climate change contributes as much as 3% to the cost of food per year, that's $3 on a $100 grocery bill. That means that uh, climate change has 20 times the influence on food prices than the carbon price. So if Conservatives were serious about fighting global inflation, they'd have a, a plan to fight climate change. The Honourable Member for Bellechasse, Les Etchemins, Les Vies. Mr. Speaker, inflation is hitting Quebec harder than any other province. Groceries up 23 percent. That's what Quebecers are dealing with. The food banks are swamped with people who can't afford to go to the grocery store. All this against a backdrop of indifference from the government and the complicity of the bloc who want to see radical tax hikes. A vote for the bloc will cost you dearly. Will the Prime Minister show some empathy, do the right thing, and cancel his costly carbon tax? The Honourable Minister. The Honourable Minister. Good, after, good, good morning, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank uh, my colleague for raising this question on behalf of her riding in Quebec. She doesn't know that her, perhaps doesn't know that her colleagues in the Conservative Party voted against our, our assistance to children in 2016 with the Canada Child Benefit. And thanks to that, every month families get a tax-free check that has raised 40 percent of kids out of poverty. Is she against the Canada Child Benefit? The Honourable Member for Chicoutimi Le Fjord. Mr. Speaker, after eight years of this government, the Liberals are making Quebecers poorer. Based on st statistics from StatsCan, uh, the cost of living is going up faster than Quebecers' wages. And uh, milk has gone up 17 cents a litre. The Bloc claims to defend Quebecers, but they want to raise taxes radically, even more than the Liberals have. A vote for the Bloc will cost you dearly. When will the Liberals get rid of the carbon tax to help Quebecers keep their heads above water? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, once again, when I speak to Quebecers, they tell me it's going to cost way too much to vote for the Conservatives. The Conservatives will bring in austerity. They will cut in support to seniors and families with kids. They will make cuts to the assistance Canadians need in order to make ends meet. Mr. Speaker, we are there to support them. The Conservatives, it's not worth the risk. The Honourable Member for St. Saint Bagot. Mr. Speaker, Amnesty International is calling on EDC to stop financing Canadian mining companies in Colombia, where there are more and more human rights violations. 146 political dissidents were killed last year. 40 per six, that's 46 percent of all the political assassinations in the world. Environmental activists, farmers, indigenous peoples, and anyone who questions what mining companies are doing, they're all in danger. Will Ottawa will put an end to financing or funding for 
mining companies in Colombia, in Colombia, where there are serious concerns that they're contributing to a climate of human rights violations. The Honorable Parliamentary Secretary. Human rights. This is why we created the core to maintain social responsibility of businesses around the world. This is why we will continue always to ensure that when Canadians are doing business, when others are doing business around the world, particularly mining companies, we will always stand up for human rights everywhere, all the time. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Saint Saint Bagot. Obviously, the core can't even call witnesses. I went to Colombia in 2021 on a human rights observation mission, and I can tell you we heard some disturbing accounts. Ottawa has no idea what the mining companies are doing abroad. EDC has no credible mechanism for monitoring and tracking. Ottawa needs better accountability and transparency from the companies it funds in countries where human rights are violated. Will they listen to Amnesty International and limit the investments EDC is making in Canadian mining companies operating in Colombia. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. We have very strong export control mechanisms. We always stand up for human rights. The Canadian Ombudsperson for, for, for uh, Responsible Enterprise specifically was created so that we can work together with businesses. We know that there are ways in which that can be strengthened. This is exactly why we are listening, why when the International Subcommittee on International Human Rights did a study, the government accepted those recommendations regarding CORE, and we will work together with everyone in this House to ensure that Canada and Canadians, when, when we are abroad, stand for human rights. Good Thank job. you. Good job. Then I have Deputy to Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands, Rideau Lakes. After eight years of this government and this NDP Liberal Prime Minister, it's no surprise that their billion dollar green slush fund is lining the pockets of Liberal insiders and is now under investigation. Annette Versharen is a good friend of the Prime Minister and chair of the board that's doling out this taxpayer cash, but it turns out her own company received millions from that same fund. Wow. This Prime Minister simply isn't worth the cost. So how many other Liberal insiders got rich with this green slush Fund. Yes, yeah. Mr. Speaker, Secretary, I know the Canadians are wising up to the fact that the Conservatives are just not worth the risk. But let me answer the member's question by saying, when the minister became aware of the uh, alleged or the allegations of mismanagement at SDTC, he immediately acted and commissioned a review. The review resulted in an action plan that the executive is now uh, implementing by December. And we expect the highest standards of excellence and governance from all of our federal agencies, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Then I have Deputy the Leeds Grandville, Thousand Islands, Rideau Lakes. This is the same scandal that has whistleblowers pleading for legal and career protection after exposing this latest uh, scandal in this billion dollar boondoggle. We know everyone from the board chair to the CEO are in a conflict of interest. They all protect each other and they all make money and it's all on the backs of Canadians. This Prime Minister simply isn't worth the cost. So will the Prime Minister guarantee these whistleblowers the same protection afforded to whistleblowers in Canada's public service? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, as I said earlier, when the minister became aware of the allegations of mismanagement in this particular case, he immediately acted to commission a third-party independent review of SDTC. Uh, that review uh, produced a uh, an action plan that now SDTC is uh, implementing by December. That will make a substantive difference uh, to resulting uh, or, or uh, addressing the mismanagement. Highest, the highest standards of governance are the expectations that Canadians should have, and it's exactly what our government is doing. Deputy Lac Saint Louis. The honourable member for Lac Saint Louis. Je m'excuse. I'm sorry. I apologize to the honourable member for Leeds.
Grenville, Thousand Islands, and Rideau Lake. Apparently, you have a third question. I thought you only had two today. What Canadians expect is that whistleblowers, when they bring to light corruption with this Liberal government, that they will be afforded protection. But we've seen before how this government treats the rule of law. This is a Prime Minister who blocked the RCMP from pursuing a criminal investigation into Liberal corruption by hiding documents from them. If anyone else hid documents from the RCMP, they'd end up in handcuffs. But with these Liberals, what we see is the continuation of that cover-up. After eight years, it's a Prime Minister who isn't worth the cost to our democratic institutions. So what evidence is this Prime Prime Minister so desperate to hide from the RCMP, and why does he think that he's above the law? It's no surprise that uh, what the member um, falsely claims here is, uh, is something that we take issue with. Earlier this year, when the minister became aware of the allegations of mismanagement, uh, he acted immediately and decided to conduct a fact-finding exercise through an impartial third-party review. That third party produced a report, and that report has now resulted in an action plan that's being implemented. That's going to make a substantial difference in addressing the issues that have been identified. Uh, let's make one thing cl clear. We expect the highest standards of governance from all federal agencies, and that's exactly what we're standing up for. Well said. Then I have deputy. The Honourable Member for Lac saint louis Mr. Speaker, the well-being of veterans and their families will always be a priority for our government. But we also know that Canadians across the country want to help our veterans too. Whether it's through organizations that provide housing, mental health services, or assistance with the adjustment to civilian life, Canadians and other veterans themselves are mobilizing to support our heroes. Can the Minister of Veteran Affairs tell the House how our government is helping those who support our veterans? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank my Honourable Colleague for his question. He's absolutely right. Canadians and other veterans are mobilizing to help those who's, who have served our country. Since we launched the Veterans and Family Wellbeing Fund, we've been able to invest in innovative projects like the Veteran Homelessness Project in Fredericton and the Legion Veterans Village in Surrey. Whether supporting women, f veterans, families, mental health, or employment and rehabilitation initiatives, this fund helps veterans from coast to coast. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Calgary Centre. Well, Mr. Speaker, the Supreme Court has affirmed every argument regarding the overreach of this government's disastrous impact assessment act. Its effects have been over $100 billion of projects cancelled. No major projects have proceeded. 42 projects are in limbo. First Nations can't get roads built to their communities. This bullheaded ideology has broken Canada's regulatory system. After eight years, will this NDP Liberal government finally take a lesson, abide by the Constitution, and stay in their lane? Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, after a decade of the Harper government, they gutted environmental regulation and still got nothing built. Our government is continuing to review the ruling, and we'll have more information to share soon about aligning existing legislation with the Supreme Court's ruling. We have previously said the current system will remain in place. We will have more to share soon, including any changes or guidance on the, the project. Fortunately, Mr. Speaker, the Conservatives have zero credibility on the environment. They're just not worth the risk. Once again, before we continue with questions, I'll ask members uh, please to limit their comments to the people who have the floor. Honourable member from Calgary Centre. Well, I advise the member across the way that the last project was built in 2016 was under the previous government's environmental assessment regime, LNG Canada. But the Chief Justice is clear in his statements. He says very clearly the federal government cannot overstep its boundaries into provincial jurisdiction. Who else? has said this bill was an immense overreach, every province, over 100 First Nations, industry groups across the country, this Conservative Party, and anyone who can read the Constitution. Will this NDP Liberal government finally accept this decision, respect provinces, and stay in their lane? Yeah, yeah. 
Mr. Speaker, as stated earlier, when the Conservatives were in office, they gutted the environmental protection, eroded public trust, discouraged investment, and made it harder, not easier, to build projects. This was why we delivered better rules for environmental assessments to help move projects forward. While we are making amendments to the Act, the Supreme Court was clear. This Parliament can enact legislation to protect the environment. The Conservative Party's plan to eliminate the environmental protections and disregard Indigenous rights is reckless, unacceptable. That Leader of the Opposition is not worth the risk. Then I have Deputy de Regina Wiscana. Mr. Speaker, this week the Netherlands agreed to buy liquefied natural gas from the Middle Eastern dictatorship of Qatar for the next 27 years. Last week, France agreed to buy LNG from Qatar for the same amount of time. This is in addition to similar LNG deals that Germany recently side, signed with Middle Eastern dictatorships. Mr. Speaker, after eight years, does this Liberal NDP government still believe there is no business case for Canadian LNG exports? Thank you. Mr. Speaker, it's really shameful that the Conservative Party would use this humanitarian situation to peddle conspiracy theories. We need to work with our allies and delivering clean energy that they are asking for, whatever it's hydrogen or reactors. If the member of the opposition actually cares about supporting Canadian energy and allies, they would not have voted against Bill C-49, which has created good jobs improve global security yeah. and help their allies. Absolutely. Mr. Speaker, we know that some Canadians are really struggling with the cost of living, and I recognize the outstanding support of our Muslim Food Bank, the Surrey Food Bank, the Gurdwara Duke Nirvan Sahib and Fleetwood Port Kells, all stepping up to provide relief in Surrey and the south of Fraser. Their efforts complement steps our government's also taken to help with the community and help them cope. To those looking to us for help through these tough times, can the Minister of Families, Children and Social Development tell us what Canadians should expect next? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member. I have great news. Today, 3.5 million Canadians and over 6 million children will receive the Canada Child Benefit. I know raising children is expensive, especially now when the cost of necessities is high. Since 2016, this benefit has lifted hundreds of thousands of children out of poverty. This is just one more way that our government is supporting Canadian families. Then I have Deputy to Courtney Alberni. Mr. Speaker, for two years, the Liberal government has let a shipbreaking company in Union Bay break rules in sensitive fish habitats. This could put this important ecosystem and 50% of the BC shellfish industry at risk, threatening up to 500 jobs in the local economy. Local First Nations governments and residents are asking the Liberals to stop extending the permit for the Miller Freeman to be allowed to sit above the high tide zone. Will the government stop allowing this dangerous activity? Activity and further develop shipbreaking regulations to protect coastal communities. Yes. Mr. Speaker, the Canadian Coast Guard is aware of an incident involving abandoned vessels in Union Bay, British Columbia. The Coast Guard is working with the government of BC and it's ready to assist with the situation as required. Furthermore, Mr. Speaker, the Canadian Coast Guard has reminded the parties involved of their obligations under the Canada Ship Bill, uh, Shipping Act. We will continue to monitor the situation, Mr. Speaker, and will be ready to assist local officials if required. Here, here. Then I have Deputy de Spadina, Fort York. Mr. Speaker, this Liberal government suffers from amnesia. It forgot its election promise to Toronto to help the city with its deficit, and it's forgotten the 1951 UN Convention to the Status of Refugees, of which Canada is a signatory with obligations to support refugees we accept. Under the Resettlement Assistance Program, the government's supposed to help refugees get essential services and support for basic needs. Mr. Speaker, given last summer's debacle as refugees and asylum seekers slept on the streets, can the minister confirm the government will provide Toronto financial support to avoid a repeat, or does the government want to see refugees sleep in the snow? 
Honourable Secretaire parlementaire. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As the number of refugees worldwide grows, Canada continues to protect the world's most vulnerable and be a leader in refugee resettlement. In 2020, Canada resettled one third of all refugees around the world. In addition, between January and July of 2023, Canada has resettled 27,400 refugees, over half of our 2023 target of 51,300. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This brings to the end of oral questions. I recognize the member from Calgary Shepherd on a point of order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um